Uh, I will get started then. Let me get my clicker at the ready. Uh, authorized. It's not a yes, no question. We are probably mostly all familiar with the idea of knowing whether or not somebody is logged in. We can do things in our applications that will uh, either work if they're, they're logged in or not if they're logged out. We, we have this idea of authenticated. Uh, we also have ways of building these login mechanisms really easily. This is a screenshot from Laravel, but you've also got um, Django's auth capabilities, and even Flask has a, a login mechanism that will handle uh, some of the underlying features of authentication and manage a username password type login mechanism. But the thing that all of these uh, have an issue with, I've skipped one slide ahead already. Uh, the, the other option is uh, just not even writing your own login form and going with something like a social login. So just log in with uh, Twitter or Google or one of the other social media type logins. And at least that way, you know whether or not they're logged in and you get a little bit of user information about them as well from the, uh, the social login provider that you're using. But like I was about to say, the problem with these is that you only get a yes, no answer. Are they logged in or are they not? We don't get any more nuanced information about who they are. We can't do things like, do they have permission to do something? We have no concept yet of whether or not they have these permissions. So my name is Ben Decry. I've been a software developer now for 21 years. That number keeps going up. And the little emoji that I've got there of the old man is certainly how I feel sometimes when I think about how long I've been software uh, been a software developer for. But I do love it. It's, uh, it's something I have great passion for. I love the developer community as well, and I've been involved in conference talks for almost all of those 21 years, probably about 15, 16 years. I am a huge, uh, I'm hugely passionate for the developer and open source communities, and I'm also uh, very passionate about privacy, advocacy, uh, and civil liberties, and all the things that kind of run uh, in, in that sphere. So two years ago, almost to the day, what are we, the 2nd of October now, 17th of last month was my two year anniversary at AuthZero. Uh, and I joined mainly because uh, the, they love supporting the community and the developers, they're into security. And uh, it was another way for me to be able to go out and meet people at conferences and events back in, do you remember when we still were allowed to fly? I, I barely remember it, but I, I, I hope it comes back again soon. Uh, so that's why I started working at AuthZero a couple of years ago. But even before that, I was using AuthZero, um, their products, because actually mostly because of the documentation. Uh, the product's great, but the documentation is just, Anyway, so like I've said, my name is Ben Decry, which means that my uh, social media handle almost everywhere is also Ben Decry. Please get in touch uh, any way you want to. I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. I'm on Twitch and YouTube and just find me whichever way you prefer to communicate if you want to connect. My DMs are also open on Twitter, so we don't even need to be connected for you to send me private messages that way. It's a great way of getting in touch. Anyway, on with the show. Let's talk about access control. There's predominantly two overarching areas that we want to think about when we talk about access control. Uh, there's a lot of subtleties around it, but there's two main things that I want to talk about. The first one is attribute-based access control, or ABAC, and the other one is role-based access control, or RBAC. You might have heard of these terms. Maybe you're even familiar with how they work, but let's have a look uh, a little more deeply at what the differences are and what the features of each are. Let's have a look at ABAC first, or attribute-based access control. When you come to looking at attributes, it's not just about the attribute uh, of the user. It's about an attribute of many things. So the user, or in this case, the subject, is certainly uh, a, a, an entity that we can assign attributes to. We also have actions. These are actions that, uh, that take place. We have objects, which are the things we actually want to access. And then we have some more um, contextual information about the, the situation as a whole. So let's drill down a little bit further. As a subject, as a person, we might know which department you're in. Maybe you're in the HR department, therefore you might want to get access to personal records. Maybe uh, you're working government and you have a certain clearance level to get access to certain bits of documentation. Or maybe uh, it's a social media site and you can only use it if you're over a certain age, or there are certain functionalities that are uh, disabled if you're under a certain age. Or maybe you want to disable functionalities if you're over a certain age. I don't know. Whatever the, the reasons, age is a perfectly uh, acceptable and common attribute of a subject when, it, when you're looking at attribute-based access control. What kind of actions can we see? Well, there are, there are many. We're probably mostly familiar with CRUD, create, read, update, and delete. Whenever we look at any kind of API interaction or 
developing models around data that we're storing in a database. These are the four actions that we do a lot of. So those are obvious actions that we can uh, put attribute flags to uh, in terms of uh, connecting a, a subject to an object, what kind of action you want to perform. But then, of course, you can go a level further. They can be more process-related actions. Maybe you want to say whether or not somebody can take multiple bits of information and generate a report. Or maybe it's a workflow process where somebody is requesting annual leave and you either can or cannot approve that. So it doesn't necessarily need to be about, uh, the action doesn't need to describe exactly what you're doing to the data. It can be part of a process. So it gives you a bit more control, uh, fine-grained control over the types of actions that you can define that can or cannot be done. Most importantly, obviously, is the object. This is the thing that we're stopping or allowing access to. The types of things that you might have uh, in terms of attributes for an object are, well, type is, a, is an important one. Is it medical records? That's obviously highly sensitive. Or is it public tweets? Probably less sensitive. Anybody can read a public tweet. Not everybody can read a, a medical record. What about clearance level? We've already know, defined that we could assign a clearance level to uh, a subject or a person wanting to access it. But then we also need to store an attribute of clearance level against the object so that we have a point of comparison. And then you might have things like geographic regions or, or more um, location-based information. Perhaps you can only access things when you're in an office or from a certain country. And contextual is an interesting one. So this doesn't really relate to any of the first three but allows you to provide a bit more nuanced access control based on other things that might be going on. Uh, typical examples of this would be something like time. Are you allowed to access things outside of office hours? Or maybe you're an accountant and you have access to your customers' uh, uh, accounting records and you do a quarterly return for them for them to submit to their tax office. You're only going to need access to their information for maybe a week or two right at the end of the quarter, or probably actually just after the quarter, so for maybe the first week or first two weeks of a quarter to access the previous quarter's information. So you can do things at that level there. And then location. Obviously, we, we know that we can lock objects down to certain locations. We need to know where the user is at a point in time. So if they're in uh, the wrong country, then they can't access information. So you can see there's a lot of stuff going on with attribute-based access control. And it allows us to really hone down and say, we, we, we know that somebody wants to do an approval process. We know that they have the clearance level on the object that they want to do the approval process on. And we know that they're in the right geographic region to be able to do it. Therefore, we can grant them access. So you can think of attribute-based access control as a lot of if-thens stacked together that come out at the end of the day as a true or a false. It can be a very long chain sometimes as well. All right, let's move on to role-based access. This is gonna be a lot faster because it's a lot simpler. Essentially, we have three things that we consider. And whereas attribute-based access control had these four columns that were all quite independent of each other but could be linked, these are intrinsically linked. We have users, each user can have one or more roles and each role can have one or more permissions. A permission can also belong to one or more roles and a role can be assigned to more one or more users. So there's all these many-to-many -many relationships, but it's only between the two. Now, theoretically, there, it is possible in a lot of systems uh, to have a user be granted permissions directly. Oftentimes, you probably won't want to do this because it makes maintenance a lot harder. If you know that a user is a member of a role, you can infer the permissions they have. If you want to change the permissions that all HR managers have, then rather than having to edit every user, you just end, edit the role. So by and large, you'll find that the role is not excluded out of these relationships. So an example of this might be Sarah. Sarah is a senior partner at a law firm. I've been watching uh, Suits a lot recently, so law is on my mind. And uh, they they recently, they didn't actually fire any of their staff. The staff actually all just left. If any of you have watched Suits, I'm just at the point now where Mike gets out of prison again. Uh, so, but Sarah is a senior partner and she is allowed to fire the associates. Uh, so this is a very easy to follow chain of uh, of permission. It's, uh, it's quite succinct. And at a glance, it's easy to see what's going on when, when you see these relationships next to each other. Whereas with an attribute-based access control, sometimes it takes a while to look at all the pieces and get them in your head and work out where the rules flow. So quick over overview of comparison. I've kind of touched on these already. Attributes-based access control, it's really powerful. We saw in that, that final slide of the attribute-based access control how you can pick and, and, and choose each of the combinations of attributes that you want to uh, satisfy in order to 
allow access or deny access, depending on, on which way you're running this thing. It is complex, though. To define all of these things requires a, a lot of planning and a lot of thought uh, because you could easily over-complexify over -complexify the situation. Um, but with that complexity comes really fine grained grain access control. You can uh, be really specific about one document because it's uh, it's got a certain clearance level and it has to be within a certain region, whereas anything else with that clearance level could be accessed from anywhere, for example. So it gives you a lot of control. Role-based access control gives you less control, but it gives you that at the benefit of a lot of simplicity. It's also a lot faster. If you consider the whole if-then-else uh, example that I gave in the attribute-based access control, it can become a very long statement to calculate. And imagine you're a computer and you've been told, does Ben have access to this document? With role-based access control, you can just look at the document and you, you know that the action is look at document. So you can say, does Ben have read permissions on this document? Well, he does if he's in a role that has read permission. So it's a fairly simple lookup. Whereas in attribute access control, you've got to do all of these calculations and work out whether they're all true and then bring all of that together in one go to work out whether or not you have uh, access or I have access to that document. Now, computers can do that quickly, but it's still going to be extra load. So it doesn't scale as easily as role-based access control. So which one should you use? I love questions like this in conferences because invariably the answer is always both or either or it depends or there's no easy answer to this. But generally, when people uh, ask me for recommendations on how to implement access control and which of these to go with, I generally say, look, start with role-based access control because it's easy. It's simple. It's easy for you to understand what's going on. It's easy for you to train other people within your organization to understand how to configure the access control and to know who has which permissions. Now, there will come a point, potentially, maybe there won't, but in some situations, there will come a point where role-based access control isn't enough for you. It does just about all of it, but then maybe you need a bit of extra refinement around some areas of control. And for that, you can then add access-based access, -based access uh, sorry, attribute-based access control on top. You can layer it. So you can have all these gateway, uh, these um, uh, gateways, I guess, uh, in place to check whether or not the role satisfies access. But then you can also layer on top of that, yes, they have access to edit on the condition that, and then you can start looking at some of the attributes as well. So it's a good, good way of minimizing the overall load. Remember, uh, RBAC is faster and easier to manage, whereas ABAC is more complex and is going to take uh, generally more processing time to calculate all of these things. So if you can not calculate the ABAC, if you don't even satisfy the RBAC stuff, that's going to save you time, save you processing, save you scalability, all sorts of things like that. All right, demo time. I think we are about 15 minutes in. Um, we have another 15 minutes. So I want to go through and just show you uh, an application that I've written. In fact, I'll just, um, yeah, I'll, I'll show you the, the live stuff. I've got a couple of slides that kind of go into how I built it, but I think it's probably easier just to dive straight in. So let me make this smaller. So I've designed this around the concept of a shopping system. Uh, it's called the Oldie Shoppy because it's an old shop. And uh, I originally wrote this as a uh, as a demo in uh, React at the front end. And I thought, you know what? I'll see whether I can repurpose it, re redesign it really quickly in Flask. I was trying to weigh up between using Flask or Django. And I thought, you know what? I'll just go with the, um, the, the, the lightweight approach. Uh, and I built this. It's not necessarily perfect, but you know, I started this morning. Uh, it's currently uh, 11 PM in Australia. I have my coffee which has been keeping me awake. And for any other Australians or Australian Australia files out there, I have my packet of Tim Tams, which is my chocolate sugar sauce to keep me going, uh, which is why I'm not asleep yet. So we're, we're good so far. <laughs> right, so we've got this shopping site. Uh, in here, we've got uh, three items which are pulled out of a database, uh, which are actually in a, uh, let me just refresh over here, They're actually in an API that I'm running over on a different, uh, is this working properly? <laughs> of, course, of course it isn't. Uh, normally when I get this demo, it's in a single page app. So you'd see it here, but of course, Flask is, or Python is doing this on the server side. Um, so we can pull in our code over here and we can see down at the bottom that we've got an API over here listing on port 7,000 and our Flask app over here listing on port 3,000. So when we go to the website, it's uh, it's going to make a request to the API. Uh, so don't, don't kill me for the simplicity of the Python. It's sometimes easier to just keep everything in one file. Uh, we have our homepage here. 
uh, which basically just goes off to the API and pulls in the JSON for the, the items endpoint. And if we just open that up in a browser, we can see here that we've got three items being returned. We've got our burger, our pizza, and our tea. Uh, so we, we pull that out. We uh, pass that straight into the home.html, and the home.html goes through and basically uh, iterates through each of these items and prints out what we can see on in the web page there, which is basically uh, the, the, the list of items. What we want to do, though, is we want to be able to edit these items and add new items, uh, or rather delete and add. So what I've done, if we have a look over the server Python here, um, this is following the standard uh, quick start from Auth0, but if it's not actually using any Auth0 SDKs, it's using, and if you've done any OAuth stuff in, uh, in Flask already, you'll probably be familiar with um, the basically the, the OAuth uh, import here. We're defining some variables, uh, which is con configuring OAuth to use the Auth0 uh, identity server. OAuth obviously is a standardized protocol, so it'll work against any identity provider that's OAuth compliant. Uh, then we're creating here a, an OAuth, uh, an instance of the OAuth uh, object. We're configuring it, and then this is going to allow us to connect to, uh, or for the application to uh, force us to log in. And we can see down here, when I hit the, the button here to uh, admin, that's going to take us to the admin route. So let's have a look down here at admin. Essentially, we've just got this requires auth, which is going to force, uh, Flask is going to force us to log in. So when I hit the admin button over here, you can see we're redirected to the login page. This is hosted up here by Auth0. This will be whichever identity provider you're using. If I log in now, then I have access and we can see the, the page. Now, the issue at the moment, might be a little on the large side. So if I hit the delete button here, I'm going to get a you're not authorized to use this, uh, the, delete, the delete function. And if I try and add, um, I don't know, toast, toast costs a dollar, and it's yummy. Let's try that. OK, that's not going to work either. I'm not authorized to create items. So let's have a look at how role-based access control works in Auth0 in order to give us these permissions. If we jump over to the Auth0 tab here. We've got our uh, applications. I'm not going to go too much into depth on how to configure things for Auth0. I want you to get more of a concept of how the role-based uh, access control works, so you can apply it to whichever identity provider you're using. Um, obviously, different systems that you use will have different interfaces, but they'll probably have mostly the same kind of um, mechanism. So in Auth0 here, we've got two applications defined. Here's the single page app, which is a different demo, and here's the regular web app. So this is uh, the this this is where the configuration exists for allowing us to log into the, the Python app. And then over here, we've got our API. And the API definition uh, allows us to set permissions. So what what permissions does the API want to know that the user has? Now, remember, when the user logs into the Python app, Python is going to get an, an identity token, which tells you about the user, the name, email address, is the email validated, things like that. It's also going to get an access token. And the access token, in this case, uh, because we've linked the old shop here, we've authorized uh, this API to receive access tokens when logged into the Python app. That access token can have information inside it that tells us about their permissions, about the permissions of the user. So let's create some of those permissions. I'm just going to jump back over here because copying and pasting strings is a much better way of not getting typos. So let's just jump up. The API is actually written in Express, but the, the theory is the same uh, anywhere. So if we look at the middleware here, we've got some permissions defined. Um, it's not actually in that one. So look, so in the router, when we call the uh, the post endpoint, for example, then we check to see whether it has permissions to create items. And these here are actually just three strings. So don't worry about how this works in Express. You're not here to learn Express today. Uh, but essentially, what I want to do is I want to create, uh, in this case, because the, the, um, the Flask uh, app only uses create and delete at the moment. We only need to add the create and delete. So let's add a create um, permission. So I'm going to call that create items. Description is create items. I'm going to create another one called delete items. Uh, the main reason I'm not doing update today is because I didn't get around to adding that into the, the app that I wrote this morning. We'll add delete items. So we now have the system permissions or scopes 
that can be um, requested or required by the API in order to allow things to happen. So now we just need to jump down to uh, user management roles. We don't have any roles defined yet. So I'm gonna create a role called editor. Now an editor, I'm now going to assign to some permissions. Remember a user has roles and roles have permissions. So the editor has permissions. I'm gonna add permissions. I need to select which API I'm, I'm giving these permissions for because there could be multiple APIs in this, uh, in this Auth0 tenant. But we've only got the one and I'm gonna say editors can create items. So we'll add that permission in. Let's go back to roles again, and we'll create another role called admin. And we'll add into this one both permissions because an admin can create and also delete items. So we'll add that permission in there. And now finally, we need to jump into the users. We'll find the user that we want to modify. Uh, and in here, we can, like I mentioned, we can assign permissions directly, but we're going to assign roles. So if I assign a role here, we have eight minutes. What I'm going to do, because we're almost at the end, I'm just going to stop this for a second. I'm going to log out. And I want to show you um, in the, the, um, the React app uh, what it looks like, because we can actually look at the JSON web token if we dig in. It's not working. So this is a very similar application. It's written in React. I'm going to go to login over here, which is going to take me to the same login page. It's just logging into a different application. Before I hit enter, I want to come in. We'll have a look at the network tab. I'm going to log in here. And then I'll filter by Auth0. So if you came along to uh, the talk that I gave over the lunchtime networking session, I was talking about how the auth flows work. Essentially, what's happened at this point is the, um, the, the single page app has made a request for the tokens. Um, in the same way as the Python app would do in the backend server to server. Uh, so we can now see here that we have a response that gives us back our access token and our ID token. So just very quickly, let's have a look at what an access token looks like. JWT.io, JSON Web Tokens. It's a system written by a colleague of mine. Uh, I'm just gonna paste this in. I won't go, if you want to find out more about JSON Web Tokens, come and have a chat with me in the Auth0 booth afterwards or in the, um, the, uh, at Zulip, and I'll tell you all about JSON Web Tokens. But essentially, what I just wanted to show you over here is there's no permission stuff in this access uh, uh, token at the moment. So let's come in over here, and I'm going to assign a role. I'm going to give myself the editor role because I don't want to be able to delete, but I do want to be able to create. So now let's come in over here again, and we'll log out and we'll log back in. Again, the only reason I'm using the React app here at the moment is because I can uh, pull the tokens out of the uh, the network tab. These are exactly the same tokens that would end up in your, your Python apps. So let's come down here and we'll look at this one. Let's copy that, paste this in. It's the old one by the looks of it. Editor. Why didn't that work? Ah, live demos, you've got to love them. Let's try that one more time. I'm going to clear this. All right, let's log in. Ah, I remember why it doesn't work. There's one thing that I've forgotten to do, which is really simple and often overlooked. So under APIs, I just need to come in and edit my API again and enable down here, role-based access control. And I want to add the permissions into the access token. That was the missing part of the puzzle. All right, that's been saved. So now, uh, I'm just going to go back and hit the login button again, just to make sure that the process starts from the beginning. Now, when we make a request here for the token, we get this token and we will have permissions. So we can see now the permissions array has come in. This is what you would get in your, your Python app as well. You get this permissions array and inside you can see the permissions that have been assigned to the role that have been assigned to my user. So now if I come back in here, and I go to the admin page. Now the Python app has the new token, so I can come in here and try and delete, but it's gonna tell me I can't delete. But if I try and add my uh, toast back in for a dollar and it's yummy, I create this item here, 
now we can see that the item has been added because I have permission to do it. So it's whichever identity provider you're using, you should find that there's uh, probably some kind of role-based access control built in. One of the advantages here over doing it in, say, um, uh, Flask login or, or the Django auth is that in within your application, you're defining the access control to that one application, whereas because these permissions are going to, into the JSON web token, whichever endpoint they, they're going to, and in a service-oriented environment where you've got lots of systems that, that get touched uh, on different platforms and different languages, having the permissions wrapped up into the JSON web tokens means you don't need to re-implement your access control in each of the systems. What you need to do is rely on the data that's in the JSON web token. So let me just skip through this part here that I don't need to show you because uh, that's the demo I just gave. I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, I think we're pretty much uh, three minutes left, so I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, I think the next session, the keynote starts at half past or on the hour for the, the uh, Indian time zone. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, just reach out to me on, on Zoom or in the booth as well if you want to ask questions after the fact. Uh, and thank you for your time. The keynote starts at 7 p.m. IST, so we can send uh, any questions if you have. Lovely. Uh, there is one question in the chat. Maybe you want to take that up. Uh, is there a way to automate this process of assigning roles to users who sign in using social media accounts? Yes. Uh, so obviously, automate insofar as you need to write code for the automation component. But essentially, if I come in to uh, where is it here? They've just changed the um, the menu system on the left. There it is, uh, social. So I can come in here. You already saw when I logged in for the first time, I could log in with Google. I can add any number of other connections here to do any kind of social login. What happens if I did log in with Google? If we come back here under user management, here you can see that the connection for the account that I created is username and password. If I logged in with Google, I'd get another user in here, and the connection would be the Google social uh, login mechanism. So each user gets added into the system, and each user will have its own ID within the Auth0 database. Uh, they're, they're represented in here, even if the authority, uh, in this case Google, for example, is somewhere else. So because of that, because the users are actually stored in here, that's where you would assign the user to a role. Now, in terms of doing it automatically, there is a management API and basically, the management API is an API endpoint that you can hit that allows you to do everything that you can see in this management dashboard here. So when you log into all zero, here's where you do all of your configuration. The management API allows you to programmatically do everything that can be done here. In fact, you can do more, a little bit more, but you can do more through the management API that you can actually do through the dashboard. So what you could do in your application is once the person's logged in, uh, obviously, you're probably going to store that user ID in a database of your own. Uh, if not, you, there's a mini database against each user that you can use. So there's this, um, if you look at each user, there's a app metadata and a user metadata area. So you could store some information in here uh, that, that allows you to know uh, whether or not the roles have been set, or you could just read the roles. So conceptually, what you could do is when the person's logged in, in your application, you can make a request via the management API to say, give me all of Ben's roles. And if Ben is not in the I've just joined role, then put them in the I've just joined role. So you could do that in your application. The other thing you could do is you can put it into rules, which again is in a different place now. Here we go. So you can add new rules, and I can create a rule that happens. It's a little slow at the moment. Um, so there's an enriched profile, there's a webhook, there's multi-factor. I don't know if there's anything we could just click on as a baseline to start with, but we could, let's just do a search for group. I could remember a directory group. Uh, there isn't anything here right now, but we could create an empty rule. This is basically a, a JavaScript callback uh, that gets the user that's just logged in, uh, the context, which is uh, basically information about how they logged in, where they've logged into, and then the callback to carry on the chain of callbacks. And in here, you could say, if the user's logged in, have a look at the groups and assign them to a group if they're not already a member of group. So that would be uh, an easier place to put it because it's it's always going to run. It gets run while the user's logging in. You don't have to have it in your application. But the API management would uh, uh, API API management API, <laughs> yeah. The auth man management API gives you more flexibility. You can do you can do more there if you needed to. I hope that answers your question. 
Okay, good. That answers your question. If there are any other questions, I'm still going to be here for uh, another nine minutes or so. I'm happy to take your questions. I'll, I'll also be back over the booth afterwards if you uh, uh, if you don't want to ask your questions right now. Um, I know some people don't want to ask questions in open, so if you want to DM me on Twitter, like I mentioned, I'll just go back over here. There's my Twitter handle. Uh, again, thank you for your time, and uh, I'll see you around. One thing I'd just like to add, though, before I do go, uh, if you, I'll, I'm doing another talk tomorrow on um, identity more generally on how uh, how login flows work. Um, so join me for that one. That's over on one of the main stages. Uh, Auth0 is also a sponsor of PyCon. I'm really happy to um, to be able to do that. As I mentioned, I've um, I've been involved in in open source communities for a while. I ran the Open Source Developers Conference in Australia for about ten years, and I love to give back to communities. So I'm really happy that Auth0 um, came on board and, and sponsored this event. I'm, I'm loving the interactions I'm having with people. I'd love you to come over to Zulu, have a chat with me, tell me about uh, what you do from day to day. There's also a couple of uh, competitions that we're running, so come over and, and you could be in the running for, uh, I think there's a, an AWS, or AWS, an Amazon gift card, and some headphones. So I'll see you over there. Thank you again. It was a great talk and very informative. I'm glad. Looking forward to your uh, talk tomorrow. Okay, sweet. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of the conference.